aim, it's used sound bites, it's used selective editing, all of the tricks that we yeah. know about that you know you and I are constantly mocking CNN for. That they brought this upon, they brought this upon themselves. I mean, they really. did, and it's and the, one of the things that I, I I will admit I get a kick out of calling out their bullshit on this kind of stuff. That you know the, when you have the when you have Jimmy Kimmel bringing out his kid and using his kid as a lever for his politics. That bothers me no end in the same way that the gunshot victim bothers me in the same way that a trans advocate who may not know that much about actual biology talking about trans issues, but it's supposed to be from a position of sympathy. Injection of emotion into political issues does not make things better. It makes things worse, typically. Yeah. Right? For, for people that didn't see uh, your, your bit on that, can you just do like a quick two-minute download on what Kimmel did and, and why you thought it was so ridiculous? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was disgusting. I mean, what, Jimmy Kimmel, who is by, from, from what I hear, I mean, he's, he's friends with Adam Carolla, with a, a guy with whom I'm very friendly. Yeah. You know, he's, he seems like a nice person, but, but what he does is he brings his, his kid into it by suggesting that his kid, who had open-heart surgery uh, at Children's Hospital with uh, Dr. Vaughn Starnes, that, did it, that his child uh, was a good reason why Obamacare should be upheld in current form. Now, Jimmy Kimmel doesn't know anything about Obamacare, and it's obvious he knows nothing about Obamacare. And then, after the, after the Republicans were trying to repeal part of Obamacare, then he actually brought his child on air with him to make the case that they shouldn't repeal Obamacare. Right? He actually brought his, his little kid who's gone through surgery. Now, I have a few problems with this. Number one, I have two kids who are under the age of four. I would never inject them in a public conversation ever. I don't even post public pictures of them because I don't think yeah. that they should be subjected to that. I think using children like that is cruel. Beyond that, my daughter had an open heart surgery at the same hospital with the same doctor, okay? And I've never used that as an excuse for my opinions on Obamacare because just because my daughter had an experience, a medical experience, and thank God, by the way, she's totally fine. She'll never have to have another surgery. She's great. Starnes is fantastic. Great hospital. Good. But just because I went through an experience does not make me an expert on, on public policy. Like, if I were going to debate Obamacare, I would just tap in Avik Roy at that point. Like, I'd rather tap <laughs> right, in somebody right. who actually studies the policy. And this is one of the things that drives me nuts is we've reached such a point, we talked at the beginning about narrative versus facts. We've reached the point where if you have a narrative on a particular topic, this gives you credibility. As opposed to, you have the fact, you've studied, you've read a book, right? If you've, if you've done any of those things, that's secondary to, but it's not my lived experience. Well, your lived experience is not statistically significant. Sorry to break it to you, but your anecdotal experience in life may not be a good, it may be an an outlier, it may be an anomaly, or it may be representative. I don't know the answer. But your specific experience, well, may tug on my heartstrings. I don't know what that has to say about public policy decisions we all have to make together, other than attempting to shame me into feeling bad for you, so now I'm supposed to not look now I'm, not, now I'm supposed to kind of overlook the logical holes in your argument. Yeah, do you think some of this is just brain chemistry? Like that some of us are simply wired to think the way you think, where you, you, you sort of want logic and reason and you want to really go to it and you'll sort of go where it gets you, where I think most people, at least most people these days, are wired the other way where it's like, we're in this constant state of like, what happened when and where am I supposed to be outraged? Like, it's actually something going on in the brain or, or it's just the way we think, perhaps. So I mean, maybe I, it's a I, think, I think there's some of both. I mean, I, look, I think everyone is drawn to narrative more than they are drawn to fact. It's just a, as a typical rule. I mean, this is why right. people spend literally hundreds of dollars a year going to movies. I was gonna say, this is why right? we could have done three hours on Star Wars. Uh, and I would have right preferred now. it, right? <laughs> I, would, I would also rather talk with you about yeah. narrative story because it's yeah. more fun to talk about narrative story and it's more engaging. It's why people love the Trump reality show because it's more narrative story than it is necessarily. And like, the amount of time that you or I spend talking about the actual policy in and outs of tax reform, it's gonna be a lot less than the amount of time we spend on Trump's Twitter feed right. because narrative is just more interesting to human beings than anything else. That's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. But the question is, when it comes time for us to make good decisions about our own lives. Are we more concerned about the narrative of the grocer and what he's gone through, or are we more interested in the price of the the box of cereal? And so we're gonna need to make these decisions on public policy by moving the narrative out of the way. And so I've spent a lot of my time trying to separate the two, trying to say, okay, listen, I can tell you stories too, we can do stories all day long, but I don't think it gets us anywhere. This is why I hate when people say, well, you're denying my, my lived experience, you're denying my experience. I'm not denying your experience, I'm denying that your experience is representative of the public policy that we should follow. Yeah. This is why whenever I say, when I'm talking about police bias, for example, and somebody says, well, you're denying that I've been discriminated against by the police. No, you may very well have been discriminated against by the police. I don't know, I wasn't there, I don't have all the records, I don't have it on tape, I don't know what the, the cop was doing five minutes before and five minutes after, I don't know whether he's just a jackass to everyone and you happen to be black, like I don't know any of that. But I do know that the, statistical, that the statistics show that the number of arrest reports 
directly correlate with the number of arrests, uh, uh, with, the, with the suspect descriptions being reported by people who have actually been victimized by crime, mm -hmm. which suggests to me that there is no wild disproportion between who the cops are looking for and what they are told to look for by the victims of crime, right? So, but people don't want to hear that, right? When you say that, then it's like, well, no, you're, you're saying that everything's within, I've never experienced this. Again, you may very well have experienced it, or, you know, we live in a subjective world. Maybe it's possible you misinterpreted events, mm -hmm. right? Then that's always one that we never want to think about. Maybe we just misinterpreted the event that we were that we were a part of. Maybe it wasn't that the cop was discriminatory. Maybe it's the cop's a jerk. Maybe he's having a bad day, right? Maybe he maybe he's that way to everyone. Right. We we think we can know 